Welcome to Wisdom for Life, where we sift through philosophy to find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan. I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Greg Sadler. And today, we're talking about... Studying philosophy outside traditional academia. And this is kind of a, a long overdue episode, I think, for, for us as we were talking about it, actually texting about it uh, earlier. Was that last week that we were doing that? Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's something that we've been touching on over and over and over again, but we never really settled down to talk about it as a particular topic. And then when I texted it to you, you said, oh, that's a, that's a great idea. We should do it. And then I, it's one of those sort of things where until you actually put it there on the table, you don't, you don't realize that it's something you should have been doing this entire time, right? But then right. once you do, it clicks. And so right. that's, that's what we're going to do today. Um, and this is kind of a, a cool way to do it. Um, you know, Dan and I both are people who went to college, so we got to experience philosophy, you could say, in, in that at traditional academic setting, but we both have a lot of background outside of traditional academia as well. And, you know, I, I've always kept one foot in the the old academic, what do we want to call it, wash basin or something like Institution. that. Institution. There you go. And Dan, you know, forged a whole different path and uh, came back to philosophy. Was it was it primarily through studying Stoicism or was it something else before that? Um, there was a little. Yeah, I think it was first Stoicism at, as well as like the last semester or two of my actual academic career. I started getting into the, it in a more systematic way or like it was like my interest was extremely peaked okay uh (laughs) actually before we jump into this let me ask because you know when you say your interest gets peaked there's multiple ways that can happen for people one would be like the subject material itself is just compelling no matter who's teaching it or introducing it to you even if it's a bad teacher you're like well i want to keep studying this because this is cool but was there I mean, this is something we've never actually talked about. Did you have any professors or instructors who you know really got you into the stuff where because they were competent and and interested in the things, they managed to drag you along? No, I think it was mostly ideas. Uh, okay. like I, I don't want to uh, dismiss any of my professors. I, I found all of them to be rather competent, but I I've never been wrapped. I guess the only the only person that's or one of the few people, kind of funnily, that has wrapped my attention into a topic was uh, I took uh, accounting, and oh. for some reason, like I, I would have never taken another accounting class if it was not for the professor that I had uh, actually at MATC many many years ago. I think that makes a really huge impact on a lot of students, the the ways in which the professors present the material in ways that the students can grasp, can see the importance of it, and also, you know, convey a kind of passion for it, right? And accounting is not something that you think people would be passionate about, but, you know, people can be. You know, my dad was a tax attorney, and he, you know, I... I looked through some of his old books, uh, both law and accounting books, and they seem very dry to me, but he, he could get quite excited about it, you know? So I think being able to convey something of that, uh, it's not the only thing, obviously, but right. it makes so, a difference. So I guess, same question for you. What was the thing that immediately piqued <laughs> your interest? In philosophy? Yeah. Well, uh, I think I, I may have talked about this on the show before. I had a terrible philosophy class in high school, which then was followed by a class that was not labeled as a philosophy class. It was actually a religion class, sacraments, but it was taught by a guy who was a replacement teacher, and he taught it as a philosophy class, introducing us to Augustine and then saying, well, if I'm going to teach you Augustine, i got to teach you some Plato and some Aristotle. And he taught it in a philosophical way where there was lots of dialogue and and 
you know, knocking ideas around and seeing what would fall out of them rather than the, the previous guy. It was just like memorize the stuff in this, this dry text, you know, and he, he didn't like anyone to um, raise any issues or questions. You know? So that was, you know, it was, it was a really interesting contrast. And then, you know, when I got to college, I think I, again, I think I've told this story before my mom's boyfriend at the time um, actually her old boyfriend, cause it was a different boyfriend who got, who, who suggested I go to that college and I didn't know anything, you know? So, um, Are you the, were a tabula rasa there kind of the old, <laughs> the, the old boyfriend, um, said, declare a major immediately. And then you won't be just, you know, one freshman lost in the crowd. So I looked down the whole list of stuff and I was like, philosophy, that sounds cool. I'll do that. <laughs> And I just kept going with it, you know, so there wasn't like, and actually my, my professors in college, the, the philosophy professors, they weren't very good at all, you know, graduate school, they were great, but, but yeah, our, our philosophy professors at Lakeland at that time, college, now university, which no longer has a philosophy program, they were like 20 years past their prime and not very interested in what they were teaching. And so I, I, you know, I had a really great experience of what, what I've come to call benign neglect. <laughs> <laughs> Allow you to do a little bit of your own self uh, directed learning there. They did. Yeah. I got super into existentialism and they were like, yeah, go ahead, go do that. You know, that's <laughs> go read some books in the library and write a paper. I don't know if I'll read it or not, you know, but you go ahead and write it. And <laughs> 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 so that's academic philosophy that we're talking about, about there. Obviously not everybody's experience is quite like that, but, um, yeah, so go, coming back to where we, we started, this this is a topic that we've been kind of circling around for a long time. Philosophy is really central in this show. And, um, you know, we Dan and I both think that philosophy um, is something that ordinary people can apply in their lives to, to make them better. That's why we started the show in the first place. So um, now it's about time we actually talk about where do you find resources <laughs> for, for doing that, right? Uh, right, but also I wanted to add here that you know the whole one of the points that we're talking about this and why we're doing this and and our different experiences within academia it, in relation to philosophy it shows that it, not everyone can or should study philosophy in this traditional academic setting. It might not be the best way for you to actually uh, introduce yourself to these ideas. Yeah, that's that's actually a great point because I think a lot of people feel like unless they're in a, a traditional academic program, they're kind of missing out on something, you know? Mm -hmm. And maybe that was the case, you know, at, at one point in time, but it's definitely not the case today for reasons that we'll, we'll talk about in just a few minutes. Yeah, there's also this uh, idea of this, um, it being opaque, and it's like, how do you even enter into it? You know, this is a little bit of a digression. Um, in the 19, you can tell this by the way that people talked about philosophy in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. There was this tendency in both European philosophy and Anglo-American philosophy to make philosophy very elitist, for, for the most part. There were, there were some outliers who were doing something different, but there was this tendency to be like, oh, you're not smart enough for that. You know, you go study economics, or you go study computer science, or, you know, if philosophy, that's for the real brains, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't understand what we're doing, so, you know, just go over there and do your, your thing, right? And that was a stupid, stupid way to behave in part they came to realize this because when um in the 90s and 2000s people started saying oh well what do you actually contribute philosophy um why should we be paying money for you all these philosophy professors who were you know at that point like chairs and deans they didn't have any answer they'd be like well the intrinsic value of the the experience or stuff like that and then they'd say that there's no cash value in that so we're going to close your department down or we're going to shrink the number of professors that you have and not being able to provide an answer because they essentially talk themselves out of an answer for several generations, not being able to provide an answer to the question, what do you actually do and why should we care about what you do? That was a killer. And it's still taking its toll on philosophy departments today, I think. Yeah. 
and I think that is definitely a topic for another show. Yeah. <laughs> so let, let's talk about some of the benefits of studying philosophy. We wanted to convey this at the start, and there's some some general benefits that you know everybody can partake in. Um, Dan, you you've got some that you wanted to call attention to. Yeah. So you know we're living in this uh, a new world where you know. It, it, in decades past, you like, well, I turn on the nightly news and you could feel rather uh, confident that the information that you were being presented, you know, by your, um, oh, who's the guy who's the good night? Oh, Walter night Cronkite, like. right? Yeah, Cronkite. Yeah, yeah. Like that, that was as close to the truth as you could possibly potentially get at the moment for the, the issues of the day. But now we have such a bombardment of different information that is being presented to us that becomes really difficult to actually uh, parse out what is truth and what is opinion and what is um, intentional mistruth. And so uh, within the grand scheme of philosophy there is a subset called epistemology which is the study of knowledge how one um obtains knowledge and how one like sifts through what information can be true or not and that is becoming a, a more and more necessary tool in one's tool belt in order to actually navigate the world in a way that actually gives you some true impressions yeah i i think and it, it's it's interesting because Back in the day, we used to like look at epistemology as, um, eh, that's nice. You know, let's jump now into the real substantive stuff. I, and I, when I say we, I don't mean every philosopher. Obviously, there were a lot of people really interested in epistemology. But I, but I think Dan is right. It's taking on a much greater importance, weight, however we want to put it. Um, if we are epistemologically naive, we're really screwed in, in today's media-saturated environment especially like not even you don't even have to have like bad actors um just that we oh, have true. so many yeah, yeah. cognitive biases yeah that we unknowingly just like oh well like there's the whole thing um it's it's hard for someone to understand something that uh he's paid to not understand yeah <laughs> like if, if it works against my best interest i don't want to actually believe that like I don't know, lead and gasoline is actually uh, causing neurological damage to basically every human in the United States. And so I'm going to fight against that. I'm not going to believe that. That's uh, true. You know, and, I, you know, I'm older than you. I remember when the, the changeover came and there were indeed a lot of people who were mad about it. And, and, and we could take all sorts of automotive things. Oh, those seatbelts, they're going to make laws and the seatbelts are going to trap us and kill us. And people would say all sorts of crazy stuff like that. Um with every single change, airbags, the airbags are going to kill us. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I, I um, would say, you know, uh, is there anything more you want to say about epistemology? No, I think that that, that gives you like, well, it, th unless there's a resource of like thinking fast and slow as a book that just kind of like lays out yeah. know, uh, many tens of different uh, human biases that we all have. And it's really hard to not fall into them. I like that you identified like common uses of an academic subject within philosophy, epistemology. And so I'm going to bring up a couple other, you know, terms like that, that we, we generally parse out into whole like classes or curricula in, in, in uh, philosophy, metaphysics, you know, what, what is real and what's fake? You know, that's, that's a metaphysical question. And we don't. We often don't um, frame these in very rigorous ways, but philosophy can help us to to dig around in that. Or what's human nature? Is there human nature? You know, uh, is there something that we all have in common? Um, that's a metaphysical question. And you know, we can also talk about ethics, which is a huge field. Um, I think that, that studying ethics can be very helpful for people, even if it doesn't provide them with exact answers to things. It like helps them learn how to figure out what question they should be asking, you know, or how to screw how to fix things after they've screwed them up. That that's a big part of ethics actually. <laughs> <laughs> how to get yourself back on track. And you know, another one that doesn't get a lot of talk, but I think all of us are engaged in at one point or another when we use words like that's cool or you really ought to watch that movie or things like that aesthetics mm -hmm. you know what what makes things not just you know the old aesthetics oh what's art what's beauty what makes things beautiful but but you know asking questions like well is this is this a 
good use of my time to binge watch this series? I think in a lot of cases, that's not just an ethical question. That's, that's an aesthetic question. You know, why should I watch? So recently, uh, Andy and I watched our way through the Americans, which I keep calling the Russians because they're actually Russian spies, you know, um, but it, it, it was a good series, you know, uh, asking yourself, well, what makes that series good and worth watching as opposed to that other schlock that you could be watching on Netflix, Hulu, you know, pick whatever streaming service you want. You know, those are those are really important questions, I think. Mm-hmm. And, and how how do you come to those conclusions? And, yeah. you know, not everyone's aesthetics are the same. And so you have to, like, have proxies that might tell Some... you, like, well. Yeah, some people have poor taste. Yeah. <laughs> but what is that, right? All right. <laughs> How do you know it? <laughs> is that a purely subjective question? It could be me, too. Maybe I'm the one with bad taste, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, should... uh, oh, go ahead. Please. I was just going to say, like, um, you, you, I really like that you brought up one of these questions about ethics of, of coming back. Like once you've screwed something up, I think that's actually <laughs> kind of a, a big question that's that's pertinent to the the current zeitgeist of, um, you know, people screw up, yeah. and and what what is the process that one needs to get back into the good graces of one's community, and uh, it, it feels like that is a little bit out of whack, and I feel like that is definitely some place that we can investigate and actually come up with some like at least guidelines yeah that that's true there's um there's a whole subdivision of ethics called the ethics of apologies where they parse out like what what a good apology should include and and usually they look at like ceos of companies that have screwed up as like examples of bad apologies or they're like you know mistakes were made nobody really wanted any of this to happen all right we're done here you know um that's not a very good apology you know there's more involved in that so philosophy can help us understand those those sort of uh issues and questions you know that that everyday people have to face right Hey, so why why are you so particularly interested in this this topic of um, how to get resources, how to study philosophy outside of academia? Uh, okay, so the, the whole point of this show is that we can use like the wisdom of the ages in philosophy to make our lives better for those around us and ourselves, and that's I, I think a very I don't, a noble noble. Um, a goal to have to like, I, I would like to give back to the world a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, you've experienced some of that, right? So is this, is this like a paying it forward thing for you or? There's definitely a certain amount of extent to that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was, you know, like you had, uh, anger issues early in my life. And then I had, um, I, I calmed down a little bit by college. By the time that I was, by then I had to deal with some really negative uh, social experiences, and and then I found you know stoicism that allowed me to deal with these in a lot more productive way. And so that was ah, definitely yeah. something that like pulled me deeper into this. And it's like, oh, like there is something here that is actually beneficial that I I want to explore as much as possible, um, because it, it's already giving me such benefits. And yeah, I'd like to have other people have those benefits if they are willing. Yeah, there is something, and that's something that's talked about too, by the way, in, in ancient philosophy and medieval philosophy quite a bit, that when you when you have a good, a good communicates itself. You know, if you know that something is good for you and you're a decent human being, you want it to be not just your own private, like totally walled off thing, but you want to share it with others uh, to improve their lives. That's That's part of our social nature you could say you know and and for you greg well you know i've i've had a lot of experience over the years with living a kind of double life you know i was a full-time philosophy professor an assistant professor at ball state university when i taught in the prisons and then at fayetteville state university and then i i began you know i moved up to new york and i i started adjuncting and doing other things and early on i started getting involved with like you know the 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 early 2010s were this time of like everybody bringing out a new 
educational platform that was going to like change everything. There was MOOCs and there were like, you know, I got involved in, in a whole bunch of educational startups, um, most of which failed, which like most other startups, right? Surprise, surprise. Um, and they are all going to like totally revolutionize things. And, and they made me think about, well, how do you how do you do philosophy with with um, regular people rather than in strictly academic settings? And so I, I found I really like that stuff, you know, and then there was also like, you know, the YouTube channel and other things as well. So I saw that there was this really deep hunger out there for substantive engagement with ideas, not just, you know, spoon fed, let's make every dumbing down is what people would often say, right? Um, ordinary people, not everybody, but but a lot of people really wanted to, you know, to learn things and not just learn trivial things, but to learn important things. And those needs weren't being met by the entertainment and news industry that we have, our traditional media. And they weren't being met by universities and colleges either because they, you know, they might put on an occasional talk for local people to come into and then contribute some money to the department or whatever, but they, they weren't doing any real effective outreach. And so when I, would, when I did my own kind of, let's say it, you know, kind of made up on the fly and sometimes half-assed kind of uh, uh, outreach of my own, you know, kind of just seeing what would, would work out, there was a very positive response. You know, people would like watch my, my videos that weren't, in my view, particularly well-produced and they'd be like, this is amazing. You know, I, I can't go to college, but now this makes me feel like I'm participating in a classroom or I'd go and give a talk at a library and people would come up afterwards and they'd say, thanks so much for, for uh, doing this. You know, nobody else is doing it. Um, so I, I kind of think that there is something out there that we could contribute to. And when I say, you know, we, you and me, Dan, uh, we're just like, you know, one little node and a whole bunch of other nodes. But we can all do our part in making, eh, this is going to sound kind of trivial, uh, you know, but making a better world, making a world in which people can actually study philosophy without feeling like gatekeepers are blocking them or, you know, that if they say the wrong thing, they're going to get thrown out of the room, you know, where they can learn, where they can, right. where they can develop, you know? Yeah. I, I feel that strongly. So, you know, I'm, I, uh, I feel it strongly because like I, uh, went and audited a couple of courses, uh, after I was done with the mm. university and I only had that, opportunity because of where i happen to be in my life but that anyone that's working a nine to five yeah. would not have had that opportunity whatsoever and and i i found such great value from taking these uh, extra philosophy courses just as you know uh, as an audit of these that uh, you were providing that that i wouldn't have had if i was in a traditional job at that moment in time yeah you know Going back to like MOOCs, I, I, you probably remember them, right? Early, yeah, early they're still around. Yeah, you know, the the big problem with MOOCs was that people thought like all our eggs should go into that one basket. And as it turned out, they, they weren't a very good way of delivering content outside of certain subject areas. Like if you were doing coding and computer science, they were pretty successful. If you were trying to teach history, the completion rates were in, 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 abysmal, you know, mm -hmm. or, or other um, divergent subjects like that. Um, but for the people who did them, you know, and, and saw them through, it worked pretty good, you know. It just went to show that we, you know, we need to avoid messianic stuff and, and look, be much more pragmatic. Look for what, what actually works, what meets people's needs and desires and, and uh, helps them develop. We should, we should talk about what we mean by traditional academic. We've been throwing this term around quite a lot. You mean the ivory castle, right? Or the ivory tower? <laughs> the ivory castle with all the ivory towers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and I mentioned, you know, I used that word gatekeeping, right? Mm -hmm. It's, that's part of a castle too. You got to get around the, the moat and go down, you know, get yourself in the drawbridge, you know, for, for the way people typically think of college education, it's something you pay for and pay a lot for. 
um, unless you, you know, get a, uh, as in the movies, they always get a scholarship and the scholarship covers everything. These scholarships hardly ever cover everything, <laughs> um, you know, and, and you take the classes that they, they give. Um, and it's very much a crapshoot, you know, the, uh, the dirty little secret of academia is you don't know anything about the institution until you actually spend some time within it. And things vary wildly, not just from one college or university to another, but within it, from one department to another, from one professor to another, from one class to another. And so, you know, you can go to, the, you can go to Harvard and you can shell out tons and tons of money and have a terrible educational experience. And you can go to, um, you know, we'll just take some of the local Milwaukee institutions. You can go to, to Marquette and have a decent experience, but you might actually have had a better experience going to Cardinal Stritch or going to UW-Milwaukee or going to MATC, you know. Um, it really depends so much on what is being put in front of you. And there's, there's really, there's, there's no consistent quality control, you could say. You and, then and there can't be. And and then you add on top of it like the the student organizations can really also mm. make or break in like the the community of the students and those those are constantly in flux you know, like uh, any student yeah. organization has a, a memory of about four years and so this thing was, best. Like, yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah you like with philosophy we'd be talking about like philosophy clubs right mm. and that's always dependent on some go getter students who hopefully are not having a bad you know romantic relationship or death in the family or anything like that to do all the the groundwork and then they have to have a faculty advisor who may be doing it just to get you know a service line on their vita or because they really care about it you know I'll, a little bit of a digression here um, when i was at marist college there were two people in the department who saw the writing on the wall that if they didn't like boost the number of majors, there'd probably be some cuts. And those two really did a lot of work. And they had 60 philosophy majors by the time that I left there. For a small liberal arts school, that's a lot. <laughs> you know? So, you know, that contributes to a nice environment. But how, how do you know that you're going to get that? You, you don't, you know. And most people still today uh, can't participate in that. They don't have the money, they don't have the available time, they've got other commitments like children or um, you know, caretaking or whatever it's going to be. What, what is the life of contemplation if you've got three kids and a 40 hour a week job, if not two? You don't have a life of contemplation <laughs> if you have three kids, <laughs> unless you train them really well. <laughs> So, you know, there's uh, there's also a lot of adult education, you know, um, auditing, Dan mentioned. Auditing is when you go to a class and you're actually taking the class, but you're not taking it for credit. And so you don't have to complete the assignments, but you get the, the class experience, right? Mm -hmm. And that's nice if you can get it, but it's got to fit your schedule, you know? Um, most classes are in the middle of the day. That's true, yeah, because most professors want to teach their class, you know, like a regular job. Um, so, you know, the contemporary academic setting is just one of many different possible settings and models for studying philosophy, engaging with others. And it's, it's not something that historically was the norm, you know. Mm -hmm. um, people have studied philosophy outside of traditional um, accredited credentialing settings for thousands of years you know they also did study in like aristotle's lyceum or um plato's academy but you could you could also you know wander around with Crates the cynic and he'd teach you some stuff while you're scrounging or you know mm -hmm. i guess th there's still a little bit of um that you can see a lot of uh at least philosophy is a way of life in a lot of like martial arts studios and so they there's this yeah. combination of, of working the body and the mind um there's there's a couple other places you know you can definitely there's a an aspect of that in many religious organizations like there is uh you know a philosophy and morality that are just dif different and distinct between like Buddhism or Christianity or, you know, take your pick. There's always, there's almost always a, a philosophy of life that is associated with them. 
That's true. And, and actually, we should talk about like philosophy. There's like philosophy in a narrow sense, traditional academic philosophy, which most likely doesn't even include, you know, half of what we could call philosophy. Like if you want to study um, Hannah Arendt, you're probably not going to do that in a philosophy department, you're probably more likely to do that in a political science department. Same thing with Alexis de Tocqueville. If you want to study, um, you know, some continental thinkers and your philosophy department is analytic, well, then you got to go over to the English department or the ret comp department or pick whoever, right? So um, there's there's a lot of, of scope for widening your... Um, what would we call it? Like, you know, what makes philosophy available by going to other other places, you know? Right. To be a little bit eclectic to actually see the full breadth that of what is available to you. Yeah. Actually, I think, you know, we should, um, we should maybe, we were going to talk a little bit about this issue of public philosophy, but maybe we'll, we'll save that for another time and talk about, you know, what it is that that learners want and need and um then we'll jump into resources because we really do want to key you into a bunch of resources that are right that are out there um so there's so go ahead the big difference between like those people that want a a potentially a really clearly defined program um and that's i guess one of the things that you would get if you go to a, a traditional academic uh, philosophy is like well here are the classes and you're gonna you might have like well, you gotta take ethics first and some logic and and then we'll start digging, getting into the more esoteric and and whatnot but like at least there's there's a prescribed course and, and you can get this uh, at least in a more layman uh way with the great courses uh, i guess could you tell me a little bit about that i'm actually well, not they're, super they're a company that um commissions academics primarily to create courses and then at first they sold them i think like on vhs cassettes you know and then now of course it's like dvds and stuff like that uh, recently massimo pigliucci did one on stoicism um you got to be kind of a big name to or, or have some juice or connections to get invited by them and and it's you know it's very much a, a program right you you mm -hmm. go through it in the steps that they want you to here's lesson one now here's lesson two now here's lesson three and that that's great for some people you know um is there you, any coursework with them no, no. I mean, a lot of these sort of things will give you writing prompts or, you know, you, you discussion questions. Like if you're using them with a group, you know, you could ask questions and um, but they don't they don't um, they don't, as far as I know, do any of that sort of curricula stuff where you're completing exercises and then they're grading them. Um, yeah. But. but Oh, go ahead. Like the downside of this is that you're you're kind of walking through this with blinders on. You can see exactly yeah. what they are presenting to you, but you know there there is a, a whole breadth of, of philosophical flora and fauna that are just outside of your view um, to to take in and to investigate, but those might not be ever presented to you. Yeah, and and you don't know whether they've got it right, and and here's the the answer: nobody's actually got it right on exactly what philosophy stuff you have to study. <laughs> you know, they'll they'll all try to tell you that they do, but um, the diversity of of perspectives gives you the idea that maybe nobody actually knows. You know, um, and then then there's you know other people are a little bit more independent. They just want somebody who's going to be like a guide or they want to be in a community that suggests things, but, but then leaves it up to them and says, Hey, if you like this, try this out, but you don't have to, you know, we're going to have a discussion group on this over here. Um, that's, you know, like what we do in our, our stoic fellowship, right? We, we've got a couple different things going on. This is pretty common. You know, if you want to study Cicero's uh, on duties, we're doing that. What, what are you doing in the Sunday groups? Uh, we are uh, finishing up a uh, basically section by section of the Enchiridion and okay. deep discussion. So the, yeah. the, the sections are all of like two paragraphs at most. And so we, we somehow get an hour's worth of content from three of those sections. Well, they're very rich text, right? Oh, yes. So, 
So, you know, you, you, if somebody wants to do that, they can do that. If they don't want to show up for one of those things, that's cool, too. Nobody's going to, like, you know, give them a dirty look when they come back. <laughs> right? So I, I'm that, so happy when people come back after they've been gone a couple of years. Like, oh, yeah, you've been back. It's amazing. So yeah. a new person or a, the, a person I know that I get to talk to again. That's another important aspect of it that I think – you know, often gets overlooked. Do, do we want to study philosophy? You know, you use the word ivory tower. It could also be like the hermit's hut, you know, mm-hmm. uh, like like Heidegger's hut in the Black Forest. Everyone get the hell away from me. I'm with my books. Well, I mean, that's cool for some people, but that's not the way I like to study philosophy. <laughs> you know? I kind of like to talk with other people about it. And, and that dialogue is a very traditional way of actually oh, right. studying philosophy it doesn't yeah. i'm not going to fall into the um the pitfall of saying that oh just because it's traditional it is good or the best or the only way of doing that but it is definitely a a, a widely prescribed and and for a very long time used way of doing this yeah that's that's quite true you know interestingly when Socrates and then Plato picking up on him. And, you know, there were other people who, who wrote Socratic dialogues, Xenophon, Eschines, who we don't have anymore. Um, that was an innovation, right? Mm-hmm. Because the traditional way of, of teaching before that was not through question and answer. It was through, I'm going to talk, you're going to listen. <laughs> I'm, I'm the, the speech maker. Now you sit and, and, and see what I have to say. But you're right. It turned into a, a tradition of its own type where people are like well it must be good because it's old you know <laughs> but I, I would love to like you know shout the the greatness of this thing because instead of like i'm just gonna sit here and lecture at you yeah. we get to dig into these ideas and, and i throw an idea and you um well what about that and so now we're we're chipping away and we're we're refining this this stone into something that is a little bit more refined a little bit more uh stable a little bit more beautiful yeah. um in, in many respects and that is just not something that you get from someone speechifying <laughs> uh, at you that's true um and I think a lot of traditional education was just that, you know, maybe because people didn't know better because they liked to hear themselves talk, you know, or they felt like, well, I had to sit there and shut up when I was a student. So now they're going to have to sit there and shut up and listen to me. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, What's the, um, oh, the, there's a, a position at many uh, colleges called the reader uh, because they had these old texts and you were just there and you read it because there was only one copy of the text and you yeah. sat there and everyone listened and maybe took some notes or something and he read it. Um, so yeah, that, that's you know, a, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a funny story about the middle ages and monks. So in the Benedictine rule and the Benedictines were like the biggest monastic order in the West for quite a long time. Um, during meal times, there would be like a reader, like you're saying, and everybody would like be sitting down, eating their stuff and you're supposed to shut up and listen to whatever is being read because, you know, it's going to be edifying for you. It would always be some spiritual book, you know. And St. Anselm, somebody who I'm, you know, particularly into, he, um, he, when he was abbot he, and when he was Archbishop of Canterbury, he changed it. Once he had the authority, he was like, we're going to talk. We're, we're going to eat and we're going to hear some, something read, but then we're going to discuss it. We're not just going to, like, passively absorb it. And, you know, if you think about it, this is really audacious because this goes against the very rule of the, you know, the monastic order that he's in. I don't I don't remember exactly how he justified it, but he came up with some sort of justification <laughs> <laughs> because he, he, he liked to talk. You know, not, he didn't just like to talk. He liked to talk with people. He liked to find out what was going on with them. So, well, let's let's talk about um, resources. We've been promising this to you for for quite a while. So. We can, we can talk about resources in general, and then we'll get in a little bit deeper into it. Um, a lot of resources are, in fact, generated by academics that others can use. So, like, you know, a great example of that would be the History with No Gaps podcast, one that I particularly recommend, by, you know, organized by Peter a- uh, Adamson. Um, really nice, you know. Um, you're getting the benefit of academics. There's also... You know, philosophy podcasts with a whole variety of topics. 
that you can dip a toe into, right, as a new school of thought, as a guide to digging into it with greater depth. Um, there's also a ton of resources developed by other people these days, and this is because the internet exists, right, who are not in academia, who got interested in philosophy and then thought, hey, I want to I want to contribute. I, I, I've got some competence. I can put some things in front of you. There's also an example you, oh. that, that I particularly like is uh, what philosophizes this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And he's just a, he's got a very good Tell way about of presenting what, what that is. Cause a lot of people probably don't know. It, it's a, a, a podcast uh, that he just chooses a topic and he, he does about somewhere between half hour and 45 minute episodes. So they're, fairly easy to digest he'll bring uh either it's usually a fairly high level sometimes he'll do multi-parts on a particular philosopher but it's always well produced and um at least there's enough entertainment in the way that he presents it that is easy for me to like go into a new topic that i'm totally unfamiliar with uh, and get at least a really basic understanding is like yeah. oh that might be so interesting that i will go and pick up this author and start digging into them more deeply i think it's great that there are so many people who are not philosophy professors or even may not have been philosophy majors you know uh may, may not have gone to college at all who you know are willing to take the risk of having other people say, oh, you're not doing this right, to produce good stuff that, that other people then share and recommend. And, you know, it's, um, it's really heartening to see. Because uh, I'll tell you, as somebody who's been in traditional academia, if it was just all of those nerds, um, we'd really be at a disadvantage. <laughs> <laughs> So what were some? Uh, I guess we we've, we've talked a little bit of before, but MOOCs MOOCs are still around. Um, if yeah. You, if you want to find them, um, that those are what massive online uh, course. Yeah, I forget what the other uh, O was. <laughs> it's been so long. Yeah. Uh, uh, massive online was it open access courses? Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. And so they're just a. a a series of lectures um as well as sometimes if they're good enough to have associated uh coursework and prompts for you to actually work through uh, if it's a little bit more technically minded they'll actually give you some like problems, problems to work through, yeah which yeah. Are, are great you know uh, but there there are a number of on philosophy but it, it does help to find a professor that is at least halfway entertaining yeah that's too dry that is something else I'll say about my peers is um, it is very much a mixed bag. There, there are some people who are like born lecturers, speakers. They can take any topic and make it like super interesting. And then there's at the very other extreme, there are people who could take the most interesting thing and desiccate it, you know, and then there's everything in between. Um, some people are only good at talking about like one topic and they stray into other things. Academics who try to, who, who don't really relate to ordinary people, but try to relate to ordinary people very often quite cringy, you know, uh, to use one of the, the, you know, the kids terms these days. <laughs> well, let's go on and talk about, about one of the key um, kinds of resources, philosophy books, philosophy mm -hmm. books and articles. So yeah, I mean, they, they really are. Um, and I think a lot of people feel themselves at a disadvantage. They're like, well, where can I where can I get these? Do I have to like buy a whole library and stock my bookshelves? And yeah, you can do that if you want to, but but you don't have to, right? Mm -hmm. There's, um, yeah, and actually let's, I do want to give a shout to three really great local bookstores. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you frequent these. I haven't been to the third one for quite a long time. I'll admit, because I don't get to the airport, but Boswell's yeah. Books, you know, who, mm -hmm. who also is like a whole community, essentially. You know, they have all sorts of great um, speaker series things and stuff like that. Downtown Books, if you're into used books, that is probably one of the best ones. And I then, love their old building. It was amazing. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about Renaissance? Well, or both. Downtown. But Downtown also moved, what, five years ago? And they're, they used to have like four stories and like two buildings worth of space yeah. and it was going into another world it was like literally narnia <laughs> for books yeah now renaissance is kind of an interesting one because they're, they're actually 
So there was there was one that was outside of the airport, uh, which unfortunately got condemned. Um, and then there's the airport bookstore, which has been amazing forever. And it's one of the little gems of the Milwaukee airport. And you don't actually have to like get a boarding pass to go check it out. It's it's outside of the secure area. So some people go to the airport, park at the airport, go in to the bookstore <laughs> and, and frequent that. So, you know, those are if, if you're interested in buying books, you might check those out. Boswell's can order you books, too. You don't have to go through Amazon. But there's a, a lot of other ways to get philosophy books, you right. know. We have a, a really wonderful local library system. The Milwaukee Central Library has four different tiers underground of stacks and stacks of books. The holdings are actually so good that they rival a lot of academic libraries. And you can access anything within the system. And if you live outside of there, you know, there's probably other library systems that you belong to. You may not even know um, until you start looking online, you know, mm -hmm. what you've got access to. Uh, one more uh, physical location before we go into uh, yeah, online. Yeah. Um, philosophy departments. You oh, go to your yeah, local yeah. university. There's almost always a table full of uh, discarded. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the philosophy professor is like, well, I've got three of uh, Aristotle's uh, aesthetics. I don't need three of them. Put them out on the door or on the table. And if you happen to know where those are, hey, look, there's some free books. That's right. Yeah. And, and that holds also for other humanities departments, English departments, history departments, you know, um, it's kind of a universal thing. So um, what else? Um, we got go a ahead. number of online opportunities here. And um, so uh, the first one is a lot of material is in the public domain where we're talking about philosophy or philosophers that were around several thousand years ago to all, all the way up to rather recent but like anything over at least 100 years is in the public domain as well as a lot of the translations even of these things are also in the public tr domain um and and it's just it's free and easy to just go and look up the name of whatever you're writing and then put in pdf in google and all of a sudden you've got that article or that entire book or like yeah. um epub uh is a, a open uh book format yeah, and like archive.org is another is a place that you can you can search within their holdings. Uh, Project Gutenberg, another important one. Um, what else? And audio versions of these, um, like LibriVox, I absolutely adore uh, because it's all these people that like just get they like like reading books, and so you can yeah. find all these classics that are in the public domain. And so if you have a long commute and you really want to start digging into something, some philosophy, some, some philosophers are much better for this than others. Like I can listen to like Plato's dialogues uh, a lot better than I can listen to some one that's actually going through act uh, analytic philosophy or something. Yeah. It's like, that's really hard to keep. It's like, I need to go back and read that. Whereas if it's a dialogue, it's a lot easier to follow. Along you know, I, I really like Hegel, you know, GWF Hegel, but I remember somebody telling me that they listened to the Phenomenology of Spirit in audiobook form, and it wasn't LibriVox; it was one that they purchased. And I was like, I don't know how you would do that. <laughs> you know? I have a hard <laughs> enough time just reading it. But. So, so yeah, Dan is right. Some some things are better heard than than others. Um, you can get a lot of articles online too if you're interested in, in that. Um, Google Scholar, Phil Papers, Academia. There's a lot of other sites out there as well. Like Dan was saying, you just put in the article name and PDF, and you can see what comes up. You know. And then there's also a number of very uh, useful online encyclopedias, like yeah. uh, what Stanford's like Plato.Stanford or Stanford.Plato.org. Yep. Um, the Internet course. Encyclopedia of Philosophy. If, if if one of them doesn't have it, the other one will, mm -hmm. you know. And often they'll both have it. So, and they're about yeah. equal in in quality, you know. Yeah, it's a great uh, overview for like, well, what it was the kind of the basic idea here. If I don't have the book on hand, I can at least get that. And then it's like, well, I need to dig into this more. So go to the original text. Yeah, and the, the encyclopedia entries can be very helpful um, for getting an idea of what to look at 
next. There's other great resources as well. And again, we live in a really amazing time where not only do we have this whole internet, right, but we have mobile technology. So people can get on a tablet or phone and they can, you know, watch more hours. I mean, there's there's more hours of video out there than you could possibly watch in your entire lifetime. 20 um, lifetimes. <laughs> Maybe, maybe more than <laughs> a thousand. That. I don't, I don't, I don't know. You know, I, we did, I, who knows how many videos that exist on the internet? You know, well, and, and I, I need to really shout like, out a, a really great creator. His this, uh, this philosophy okay. guy, um, Dr. Greg Sadler or something. He's got a lot of videos <laughs> out there. They're they're mostly about philosophy, but sometimes they're about captioning and sort of the on the side philosophy. Or... Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or walking around Milwaukee. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm only one of like thousands of creators in the field of philosophy i would say you know there's mm-hmm. there's so many other people out there and I, you know and people will be like hey, have you seen so and so and i'll be like I, I only have time to shoot the videos i don't have time to watch everybody else's videos <laughs> you know? so but yeah so po- videos podcasts um i don't know how many philosophy focused podcasts there are but there's a lot of them. We've already just mentioned a few, right? Philosophize right. This, um, History of Philosophy with No Gaps. Um, are there any others that you particularly like? I, I don't get a lot of time to listen to. Um, there's a, a BBC philosophy. Oh, um, right, right. The whole BBC site has a whole bunch of philosophy stuff. Yeah, they're they're pretty great with that. I'm just, I pulled out my uh, podcast app at the moment just to see if there's anything that... Um, and uh, philosophy now, I think, was halfway decent. Um, yeah, once again, I, I will also do the history of philosophy without any gaps is a, a great um, addendum, and they also have another one that's like uh, non Euro centric, right? Because um, the the original podcast of without any gaps is is mostly. Um, Western philosophy. Western, yeah. Western with a little bit of uh, Arabian because there's that back and forth there. Yeah. And then this is, there's another one that's like basically uh, Afro and um, uh, mostly Far East China uh, they philosophy. Have Indian. In yeah. India, yeah. And so yeah. There, there's that whole, another whole area of philosophy that is uh, not oh, often yeah. read in at least the West here. Yeah. They they they're really doing a thorough job, and when they say with no gaps, they mean it. They're not like leaving out anybody. All right, <laughs> that's why it's taking them a while. They they started <laughs> over ten years ago. I remember when when the the series was just going, and I was like, wow, that's that's a cool idea. Are they really going to be able to see it through? And they have. Yeah. So so let, let, what else? Online courses. There's a lot of uh, online courses you could take for free. Dan has mentioned MOOCs. There's also um, smaller, you know, versions of, of classes. You can also purchase classes. There's just plenty of that, but you don't necessarily need to. And then lots and lots of websites, you know, yeah. um, Th- thousand word philosophy is a nice one that, that came up recently. These are peer reviewed articles, um, specifically oriented to taking philosophical ideas or problems and presenting them in a thousand words or less. And then there's communities of uh, like Reddit or Facebook or uh, those are mostly text based, but there's also some um, Discord is a, a really interesting platform if you actually want to have discussions. Yeah. And if you can find a good a Discord community for philosophy, or especially if you've got one that's like your jam of the, your little niche area of philosophy, it's like if you like phenomenology, you can find a phenomenology Discord and just talk about all that all day. Hooray! Hey, great. There's probably a place for you. And and once again, like we both really uh, promote dialogue as a way of learning. Yeah, it's again. I I'm, I've probably said this too many times, but it's it's amazing what the internet has afforded us the possibility to do that 30 years ago was just science fiction. You know, for for people who want to study philosophy, the resources are out there. Um, You know, we mentioned the Stoic Fellowship. That's just one example of uh, groups that, you know, when we're not in COVID times, actually meet face to face. That's that's a great way to study philosophy with people. Um, 
some of the other organizations that are devoted to similar things, uh, New Acropolis, which has a branch in Chicago, uh, Sophia, which is the Society of Philosophers in America, mostly oriented around like public uh, discussions. Um, death cafes, you might not have thought of that, but they're pretty philosophical, you know. I'm not even familiar with what this is. It's a really cool organization. The, the, the whole idea behind it is we're too worried about death and we're, we're too um, uptight about it. So you, you, there's really very little um, structure to it. You go in, you sit down at tables, have some coffee with people and talk about death. Oh, you know, I think and, that's, I'd love to actually try that out. Yeah, I, I, I've only been to one, but it was it was a good experience. Nobody died, you know. Um, and then what else? Um, you know, well, there's... Oh, go ahead. We, we talked about Meetup as an organization that allows you to actually find right, these. Right, right. Uh, because sometimes it becomes difficult. I guess you could find these groups on Facebook as well if you can find a local group like that. But um, And then, you know, there's conferences, both academic and, and public. And so, uh, like... Uh, Greg and I have, have uh, put on a couple of, uh, well, I guess one together, and then you've done others um, in person uh, meetups or uh, conferences. No, for we, did, we did too. Uh, Stoicon X Milwaukee and then Midwest, right? But well, I said face in person. And, yeah. Oh, okay. The, 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 right, mid, right. the Midwest was online. But yes, we That's did too. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's got to be online for a little while at least. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, conferences are a great place to meet people that that are interested in in what you're interested in. We should we should talk about some of the common um, worries that people have, and I'm only going to bring up maybe one or two of these. Um, these are questions that people ask me all the time about getting started with philosophy. So one that I really want to zero in on um, for people who are doing anything academic, my professor or program or whatever says I shouldn't read X. Should I follow their advice? And my, my answer is, Hey, it's a free country. You know, you can read whatever the, whatever you want to, you know, you don't have to tell your professor or, or friend or whoever's like telling you don't read this or that. And there's no, there's no philosophy book that's going to like destroy your mind or captivate you or suck you in like some magic spell. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to read Ayn Rand, uh, go right on ahead because you know if you'll probably get sick of it pretty quick and be like ah, a lot of this isn't very good um but she's not going to like you know automatically seduce you or if you want to read noam chomsky way at the other extreme that's fine too you know and everything in between um you're not accountable to anybody but yourself for what you want to read um and then you know what else what books or thinkers should i start with well whatever you can get your hands on you know you don't have to begin with plato or, or the pre-Socratics, you know, I've got to read Heraclitus and Parmenides. It's, the first philosophy book I ever read was Camus' Myth of Sisyphus, and I probably only understood about 10 to 20 percent of what I was reading because I was 14 at the time, and it didn't kill me to start there. <laughs> you know? You're going to go back and reread this stuff anyway. There isn't any, like, set-in-stone curriculum that you have to follow. It's, so you're saying... It's, go ahead. Are you saying that you had to imagine that uh, Greg, as an early philosophy student, was happy? Well, I was happy. I was a okay. fairly happy kid. We should talk about a practice real quick and then jump into uh, our final thought. Yeah, so a uh, practice for today is try it on for size. And so many philosophers have many different worldviews and values, and it results in certain prescribed actions that flow from these first principles. So uh, do as you know Friedrich Nietzsche suggests in uh, his works and try on a philosophy as a set of clothing. Commit to it for a time and see how it suits you. Then try another. It is one thing to just read a book of philosophy and a completely different thing to live it. That's some great advice. So we're going to leave you with uh, the thoughts of somebody who I guess you could say she's a philosopher. Yeah. Um, with the words of Marjane Satrapi, to educate myself, I had to understand everything, starting with myself.